Range. Not the only important spec for an electric car, but easily the one that we obsess over the most. And with good reason. In the early days of electric cars, they could only cover your daily commute. Then they could cover several days of your commute, and eventually they could cover short road trips. Then Tesla launched the supercharger network, and you could start to do more long distance road trips, at least in California at first, but now all over the US and other countries throughout the world. And most recently, we saw Rivian make a trek from the tip of South America to Los Angeles in their prototype electric trucks. Following along were Ewan McGregor and Charlie Borman on electric Harleys. So we've come a long way since the early days of EVs. So why on earth would Tesla be selling an EV with under 100 miles range in Canada? Well, let's read the data and find out. Before we get into the video, I wanted to give a shout out to today's sponsor, NordVPN. Are you worried about privacy online? Tired of things tracking you throughout the web? Well, NordVPN is here to help with their VPN service that includes over 5,400 servers in 59 different countries with no limits or borders. I personally have been using Nord for years to access content from other countries and even find deals on flights by changing my location to the country that I'm traveling to. Nord has a strict no logs policy, meaning they don't track or share your data whatsoever. As they say, it's none of their business. So if you haven't already signed up for Nord, they're offering a huge discount right now on a two year plan. If you visit nordvpn.com slash Ben Sullins, and if you use my name as a promo code, you'll get an extra month for free. So head over to nordvpn.com slash Ben Sullins to sign up and learn more. And now let's get back to the video. Oh, Canada, our neighbors to the north, one of the only countries in the world with a carbon tax. Nice job. And a country with a pledge to go fully electric by 2040. Beauty. And in order to get there, Canada is offering lots of different incentive programs for their citizens. In 2019, specifically, they launched a program that will give $5,000 off the purchase of a new electric vehicle. But in order for the EV to qualify for this incentive, it has to have a trim level, a model, a version that is less than $45,000 Canadian dollars. And this has led to a total gong show when it comes to which EVs qualify and which don't for this incentive. So Tesla, being those clever wankers down south, decided that they could get around these rules by software locking a Model 3 so that the entire line of the Model 3s qualify for this EV incentive, even the 70 or $80,000 version. So here's how it works. Tesla created a new version of the Model 3 that was software locked to around 151 kilometers or 94 miles and removed autopilot, which was a separate cost. This new version retails for just under 45,000 Canadian dollars, which means that it, plus every version of the Model 3 out there, also qualify for this incentive. And as it turns out, the Model 3 is the only Tesla that qualifies for this federal rebate, the $5,000 there, but each different province does have their own separate program. And so some other models and trims may also qualify. I'll put a link down to the Canadian website from Tesla that actually shows all this. Lots of different stuff going on, but the one we're talking about today is that federal $5,000 incentive, which again, only is for the Model 3. Now I chose this story because Tesla, those clever wanks, have a history of adjusting pricing up and down somewhat erratically. And recently, someone by the name Aldrix posted this spreadsheet online with all of the price changes for every model over time. It's, it's pretty comprehensive. So I decided to do what I do and make a chart of this data, and we can have a look and just kind of see what happens to Tesla prices throughout history. So again, this data is from Aldrich. I'll put the link to their spreadsheet down below. Big shout out to them as well as their referral code. If you guys are looking to buy a Tesla, you can use that, hook them up because this is really great work. Now in here, what I have done essentially is just created a line chart where each line is each different model and trim level of every single Tesla out there. So each different line is kind of a separate trim level. So performance versus standard range, et cetera. Then I've color coded them by the different models. So for example, if I click on the S here, you can see that these are all the different model S's that have existed and what the prices of those have done over time. Going back just to kind of the end of 2018 here, October, 2018. And you can see that it goes up and down quite a bit. And then you have certain models and trims that get discontinued. They they become other names and other things. And so you kind of have this erratic, but at the end, you can see that, you know, <laughs> they dropped the price here at the end of 2020. 
And then uh, early 2021 just shot right back up for most of the trim levels for the S. The Model 3 has been a bit more consistent, but there definitely has been an up and down. And that up and down has totally led to frustration online with people like Christopher Titus yelling at Elon Musk constantly, which I understand is kind of his shtick. But anyways, you get the point that it's kind of erratic how these things go up and down. And you can see that, you know, when is the best time to buy? Like who, who really knows when they're gonna make these changes? It is something that I would say is frustrating for most consumers. The Model Y does appear to be the most consistent. You can see that there really haven't been too many changes over time. And if we look at an actual trend and not just the individual data points here, we'll, we'll see exactly what's going on. So here I've taken that same data, but instead of just drawing lines throughout it, I'm looking at trends. So again, it's easier if you highlight a single one here, but here's the Model S. Every dot is a trim level and the price of that trim level at a given point in time from that spreadsheet. And if you look at a trend, just a linear regression model here, not with a great p-value, but you know, not, not terrible, giving us a sense of what's going on with the pricing, you can see that the Model S is actually going up in price over the past couple of years. If you look at the Model 3, it's slightly decreasing, but not by a whole lot. The Model X is actually coming down quite a bit. And the Model Y, as we saw in the previous chart, is basically flat. So really interesting stuff. I'm gonna post this on my website. I'll put a link to that down below. As well, as I mentioned, if you wanna see the raw data and some other charts that Aldrich put together, I'll put a link to his spreadsheet there. But the question is really, why do they do this? Why does Tesla change its prices so often? Some speculate it's because demand has peaked or they're trying to compete with other automakers who constantly have sales and, you know, Honda days and Toyota thons or whatever else out there. Or it could be just to drum up more headlines and get more free advertising because anytime Tesla does anything, there's a thousand articles and a thousand YouTube videos here about it. So there's really a myriad of options that could be the real source of why they change the price. And unfortunately, I don't think we're gonna have a solid answer anytime soon. The bottom line though, is that the trend is pretty clear. When a new Tesla comes out, it's generally the most expensive version that will ever exist, followed by cheaper and cheaper variations. At some point, they just continue to drop the prices and then sometimes they raise them, which of course hurts depreciation and frustrates early adopters, but hey, that's the price of being early, I guess. And now I wanna do something a little bit different, and that is take questions from folks on my email list. The idea is that the algorithm is relatively unreliable on YouTube, so a way to connect with you and me directly is to get on the email list, something that YouTube itself doesn't really have any say in. So for the folks that are already on there, I wanna give them the benefit of taking their questions and answering them at the end of some of these videos. We'll see how this does, and you let me know in the comments whether or not you think this is a good idea. But if you do wanna be a part of that, go to bensolans.com join, get on the email list, and you could have your question featured in a video, just like, John Emerson. John writes, Ben, critics of Tesla point out that their earnings are heavily influenced by sale of credits. That in fact, they would be operating at a loss, but for the credits. Do you agree with these analyses? Would love to hear your thoughts on the matter. Cheers, John Emerson. So thanks, John, for the question. Um, it is a good one, and I, I haven't looked super deep into it, but I did find some data on it. Surprise, surprise. First, from CNBC, from Laura Kolodny. She's uh, put out an article and uh, you know talking about this. Essentially, the, the highlight of it was that Tesla hit six billion during the second quarter of 2020, with about 7% of that, or 428 million, coming from the sale of regulatory credits. Uh, and then down below, she continues to say that basically they would not be have been able to report four consecutive quarters of gap profitability. That's generally accepted accounting principles, um, and you know, and not be able to join the uh, the S and P 500. So it's a it's an interesting one. I don't know if that, you know, how that's gonna shake out in the future. I know on a recent earnings call, they kind of downplayed that. I would really argue though that that who cares? Um, you know, other companies do this as well. Amazon, for an example, I believe the main business of Amazon, when you think of like buying stuff from amazon.com is not profitable or very slimly profitable. And that's something like 95% of their profit come from AWS, Amazon Web Services, which is, 
you know, the biggest cloud provider in the world, I think, uh, by a long shot. You know, when you talk about the cloud, that often basically means AWS. Yes, Google and Microsoft have them as well, but really AWS is the king there. In fact, for example, all of Netflix runs on AWS. So if you've ever watched Netflix, then you've gotten data and, you know, run stuff on the, the Amazon cloud. So that is where their money comes from and it funds the rest of their business. Could those be separate things? Maybe, but clearly there's, you know, having one part of the business pay for another is not a bad strategy and one that does work. The real question I think here is what happens as GM and Ford and, you know, BMW and Mercedes and everyone else start making uh, electric vehicles and Tesla doesn't continue to have 80% market share or something in the US. That's where things get a little bit dicey for them, but as things go, their costs should come down. They should be making more profit on a per unit basis. And as that goes, they should be fine. So I'm not really worried about it from Tesla's perspective, but it is something to think about. And if people are investors and they give a crap about these kind of things, sure, that's something to look at, I guess. Personally, I think investing in any individual company is lunacy and no one should ever do it. So if people are going to play that game, you know, you're... Uh, you, you, you've, you know, taking on a lot of risk. So there's kind of, I guess, my thoughts on it. Um, I, I just kind of would argue that the whole thing only should matter to institutional investors. Everyone else, who cares? And another question here from JB, lightorium.com. Ben, how can my wife and I lease a Tesla Model Y in Louisiana? With warm regards, Jack and Gay Bosberg, Bos, Bosberg, Bosberg. Well, uh, Jack and Gay, I... I I would just say don't, please don't. Um, leasing a car, as far as I'm concerned, is not a winning equation. It's never something that you'd want to do. Uh, and the reason is because if you look at how leasing works, the math of it always has to work out in the automaker's favor. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. Think of it like if it was a better deal than just buying the car, why would they do that? You know, it, it's one of those things where there are certain cases, I guess, for businesses or whatever that they may argue there's a, a tax benefit there. Fine, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about normal people. Generally speaking, my stance is you should never lease a car. You should always buy a car. You should always buy it with cash if you can. If you can't, don't buy it. Buy something cheaper. Buy something else. Um, and second off, never buy a, a new car. Always buy a used car. I, 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 other than the things I have to do for my job here, I you know, would never buy a new car whatsoever. All these things, cars in general, are just terrible financial decisions, uh, financial tools. It's not an investment. It, it's just a way to throw away your money more slowly and get some use out of it. So if you have a chance to lease or buy, buy. If you're going to buy, please buy used. If you can't afford a Tesla used, don't buy a Tesla. Buy anything else, whatever. Get all that situated first before you even think about spending money on a Tesla or any other kind of high-priced premium car like this. And the last question comes from Rick Spencer. Rick asks um, essentially about vehicle-to-grid charging, um, and he's talking about solar and getting a battery back up, and batteries are expensive. It's a very long email, but um, the question basically is like, will Tesla ever offer a vehicle to grid solution? And I, my answer is probably not. Um, it doesn't certainly seem like something that is super top of mind for them. I know Elon has commented on it a few times on Twitter, and I believe the original Roadster or maybe the original Model S had it or rumored to have had it, but we haven't really heard anything uh, about it since then. I do think it's a shame because, yeah, it, his, he points out there, you know, with two electric cars in your driveway, you have the equivalent of like 10 power walls or something like that. It's kind of ridiculous. But, you know, there's a lot of variability there. Of course, it would wear down the battery a lot. You know, so there's a lot of reasons why they wouldn't want to do that, uh, despite the fact that, you know, technically it would be fine. So, you know, there is hope here, though, uh, because, and I'll share an article I found. So on Green Car Reports, you can kind of see here that reportedly Wallbox is soon go, going to enable the Nissan Leaf to become a home energy device. So a lot of cars from Japan have had this ability. In fact, uh, you know, the new uh, Mercedes EQS, I believe, will have vehicle to grid and all those other kind of things. But essentially, there's a company here that is going to enable you to use a Nissan Leaf in the US as a battery. Now, the really cool thing about that is that um, despite the cost, looks like it'll be about $4,000 there. Despite the cost, 
a Nissan Leaf is extremely cheap. I mean, you can find them for five, seven, under $10,000 for sure. And if you can have this installed and get that in your garage and it works, I mean, you're talking again, you know, like four power walls worth or, you know, whatever it comes out to be, 44 kilowatt hours versus 13. So it's a, it's a thing where you might be able to achieve this for cheaper than buying home batteries themselves. Um, without having to worry about Tesla at all. Yes, I would love a beautifully integrated, just seamless, amazing system from Tesla, but it doesn't look like that's on the horizon. I know Lucid is talking about it, but you know, money. Um, so we'll see, you know, there might be an option here that is far cheaper than getting a, a home battery installed. Uh, yes, they are expensive. They do offer some really great benefits, but you know, it's not generally speaking a good financial investment uh, depending on where you live. So. Um, we'll see more on that. Stay tuned for the channel, uh, as always, because um, if it is out, I would totally love to try that out. That would be a great solution, you know, because not only could the Nissan Leaf power your home, you know, you could take it to the grocery store and, and fill up groceries or take the kids to school. You could use it as a car still. It would still be a very functional thing, much more functional than, you know, just a battery strapped to the side of your garage or whatever. So that's it for this one, guys. Again, if you want, get on the email list at bensullins.com slash join. Thanks for watching. And don't forget, when you free the data, your mind will follow. I'll see you back here in the next one.